Hello, BookTube. I have a, another page 112 tag for you today. Uh, for those of you who know, don't know, that is a, a thing that was created by Sean the Book Maniac over on his channel uh, as an adaptation of a French literary prize in which the judges are giving, given, they're given only page 112 of their prospective books. And they judge it on that page instead of on the first chapter, say, uh, under the idea that the first chapter is usually overpolished that it's going to be the strongest part of most of the manuscripts they get, and they want to see what the author does without the helping hands of beta readers and first readers and publishers readers and editors and sub-editors and whatnot. Uh, and Sean adapted it into a tag in which you take three page 112s from uh, preferably related kinds of books, read them, assess them, and then figure out what they are. And, of course, the purest way to do this tag is for somebody to send you the excerpts and then in a separate email send you the books so that you can literally go at them blind the way the judges of the French Prize did. And people have been doing that to me, and I want to take this opportunity to, to thank those people and also to encourage all the rest of you to do that as well. Uh, although, you should probably keep in mind uh, that I'm about 2,897 years old and that if you scan the page of a book, a page 112 that you want me to read, and you have trouble reading it, then I'm not going to be able to read it. <laughs> so better to just bite the bullet, open page 112 in front of you, and type it in an email <laughs> rather than trying to scan it. Scanners don't work. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the uh, the embarrassing confession that I have to make in the, the excerpts that I want to read today is that I immediately did what all editors do, which is to... If you get a Word document attached to an email, you immediately save that Word document. You don't expect that you're going to find it or remember to look for it back in your email. Instead, you immediately save it into a separate document on your desktop and you deal with it there. Most editors I know work on relatively the same system that I do where, where you fill your desktop with the work that you need to clear up and then you clear it up, <laughs> uh, which is why if you are a freelancer, and you are submitting a review or an essay or anything anywhere, if you're sending anything you write outside of your own computer, put your name on it. Don't expect that your name on an email or your name in a, in a subject line is going to work. It's not. Don't even expect that your name in the attachment name of the file is going to work because your editor will almost certainly retitle it along his own lights. Uh, and I did that with these, with these three uh, excerpts. I immediately saved them onto my desktop, and uh, they're only excerpts. I have no idea who sent these to me. <laughs> so if the person who sent these to me is watching this video, I'd love it if you would identify yourself in the comments so that I can give a nod in your general direction. Uh, but uh, I've read the excerpts now. I'm going to read them out loud to you, and they are all Roman historical fiction. So it has to be somebody who watches my channel. The, the odds against the coincidence would be too great. I'm a big fan of Roman historical fiction, and not only that, but I have myself written. Roman historical fiction, and for the fun of it, and loved doing it. Uh, so I don't know who these are from. <laughs> once they once they put their hand up in the air, we'll all know. Uh, but I'm going to read you excerpt number one. Uh, uh, let's see here. Yet neither of the of the, yet neither of them were men of Longinus's stature. Here was a man from an illustrious family who had served the republic as master of the state mint, praetor, and only previous year as consul. Why should he have to suffer the ultimate punishment, death, when his inferiors did not? Was exile a better alternative? Crassus regarded Longinus. He was an, he, he's an able man. It would be pointless to have him fall on his sword. After he has made amends with the gods, let him be stripped of his office and pay a large fine to the treasury. A short pause. I think that would be a fitting punishment, said Caesar loudly. Agreed, called one of Crassus's supporters. Loud murmurs of concurrence rose from his faction. No one else spoke. Crassus seized the moment. There's no need for Longinus to die, not when others who failed also have escaped such a fate. Too true, Caesar's tone was acid. Uh, Crassus smiled beatifically at the consul's futile glares. This was only the start, you fools. Longinus must stand down, cried a senator who followed Pompey. Stand down, stand down, stand down, went the chant. Irritated, Gellius waved his hand. All right, it seems, Longinus, that your fellows wish you to resign as proconsul and pay a fine? He glanced over the floor. Yes. So you are to pay a fine to the state treasury of, 
he conferred with Lentulus, 5,000 denarii. Don't forget his penance before the gods, said a voice. Longinus shifted his feet, uh, lifted, Longinus lifted his head. It will be the first thing I do when I leave the Curia. I thank my fellow senators for their clemency. I will continue to serve the Republic in every way that I can. Undoing the red belt that signified his stature as a general, he let it fall at the consul's feet. He saluted them and then, without looking to either side, walked proudly from the room. An audible sigh rose up from the gathered politicians. And so the real issue, and so to the real issue of the day, whispered Crassus to Caesar. What to do about Spartacus? Precisely. The consuls must also be made to pay for Longinus's failure. The poor choices that he made reflect upon them as leaders of the Republic. Okay, that's the end of the first excerpt, and I couldn't have ended fast enough. What absolute... <laughs> what absolute crap! <laughs> okay, uh, I hardly know where to start with all that's wrong with this. First of all, every single historical detail in here is wrong. <laughs> if, if someone... <laughs> every detail in here is wrong. The Roman Curio was not set up in a way that would allow this scene to happen. And that would allow a general to drop something at the, the collective feet of the consuls present, since they're all over the room, then turn on his heel and walk without looking left or right. If he did that, he'd walk into a wall, and then they probably would kill him. And also, in ancient Rome, death was not the ultimate penalty for a public man. And also, I don't know what that red belt business is. And a million other things. A million other problems with this. Like, for instance... I think that would be a fitting punishment, Caesar said loudly. How do you say that loudly? <laughs> or, uh, or uh, uh, where was it again here? Don't forget his penance before the gods, said a voice. Well, yeah, it would be a voice, wouldn't it? <laughs> or or uh, an audible sigh rose up from the gathered politicians. <laughs> As opposed to an inaudible sigh. <laughs> As opposed to maybe maybe the members of the Roman Curia who are also members of the order Microchiroptera. They're little bats, and their sighs are not audible. <laughs> uh just awful. <laughs> it was just awful. You stumble, you halt, you trip, you're irritated the whole time in a scene that's supposed to be really good. Uh, so I, <laughs> and also pivotal. So I, and and about Spartacus, for God's sake, who'd have thought anybody could make Spartacus boring? Uh, let's let's just move on to, to, to excerpt number two. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I hope that these meet with your approval, centurions, and solve the problem. You'll understand that errors sometimes occur. But that's soon amended. I'll have to discipline that blasted clerk issuing such shoddy gear to an officer. He reached a hand out to take a bundle of rejected kit, only to find Marcus's hand there first, closed over his podgy fingers in a firm grip. Rufus leant on the counter, resting his chin on a bunched fist, a half-smile playing on his lips, his eyes boring into Annius's. Behind them, Antinoch lounged against the wall, pointedly studying his fingernails for dirt, while Dubnus prowled around the room, casting dark glances at the officers, at the store's officers. The younger man spoke again, his voice quiet and yet shot through with steel. If only it were that simple. You see, when I discovered the poor quality of my own equipment issue, I was prompted to check on the welfare of my men. You'll be surprised as I was to learn that I found many of them apparently undernourished. Their food is both insufficient and of a disgusting quality, and has been so, I'm told, since soldier Trajan was appointed temporary centurion several months ago. Interestingly, when my chosen man offered to take Trajan out over the wall for a short patrol into the forest last evening, he insisted that his purse of gold be a contribution to the, centu the century's funeral club. He released the other man's hand, pulling a leather bag from his tunic and spilling its contents carelessly across the counter, watching the fear grow in the other man's eyes. The coins rattled on the wood, each spinning gold disc reflecting tiny flickers of yellow light as it sank into the stillness across the flat surface. A long silence stretched out as both men stared at the small fortune lying across the counter. Apparently, he wanted to make amends for his previous greed. It seems he was foolish enough to have participated in a scheme to make money by supplying his men with substandard rations and sharing the profits with somebody in your department. Okay, that is excerpt number two. That was also absolutely god-awful. <laughs> so I, I don't know if maybe this was the point, 
or if we, our luck of the draw is just really bad. <laughs> Again, I don't have any idea where to start. I don't know what these names are. I don't know if you... Uh, he reached out a hand to take the bundle of rejected kit, only to find Marcus's hand there first, closing on his podgy fingers in a firm grip. So Marcus's hand closed on his before his hand got there to be closed on. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know what these names are, Antonok and Dubnus. And also, I don't know what the post of temporary centurion is. <laughs> and, and I also don't know, uh, I know all the rules with, involved with uh, uh, Century's Funeral Club, and this is the, the either uh, there's a huge amount of context that is explaining what looked to me like just a whole page full of gaffes, uh, or this is just shoddily done. <laughs> huh. And and what is supposed to be, I'm sure, a very telling little speech about you know the poor quality of the food, uh, is boring again. It's just it's just stodgy. Uh, uh, so I, I don't know what to say about it. It seems to have at least a sharper interpersonal dynamic going on than the first one. The first one, the first example had no humans in it at all. The second one, at least it seems like the author gets that, that, you know, that, that it's, the, it's a writer's duty to make a conversation as interesting as anything else. Uh, and, uh... I don't, I don't recognize this at all, but I, usually the authors who do that in conversation, who, who, who can charge a conversation with menace or threat, are also pretty good with action scenes. So we, we can hope that somewhere else in this book, whatever it is, <laughs> uh, the author redeems themselves. <laughs> but now, uh, chastened and with no hope at all, we're going to move on to the third excerpt. Uh, uh, this is the third excerpt. Six months before, using the fortune that had propelled him into the realms of Rome's elite, he had engineered a nomination to the position of senior consul for one of the sycophantic junior members of the Senate. The vote had been close and costly, but in the end he had been narrowly defeated by Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio, one of the wealthiest men in Rome, and one whom Duilius knew he could never control. The defeat had been bitter for Duilius, whose first setback since setting out over 15 years before, and the enmity between the two men had now divided the Senate into three segments, those firmly for Duilius, those for Scipio, and those and a malleable majority in the center, whose votes were surreptitiously sold to the highest bidder. So no division. <laughs> no, sorry, no, no editorial interruptions. We'll get to the end. Oh my god. All right. Uh, <laughs> Lucius Manlius Volso Longus, a recently elected senator, quickly adjusted his gaze to the gloomy interior and rapidly searched the room for the man whose acceptance he craved more than anything in the world. He spotted Duilius and crossed the floor, his appearance putting an end to the honeyed words that Duilius had been speaking to a senator beside him, a senator whose vote Duilius had purchased many times. The junior consul looked up irritably. What is it, Longus? he asked brusquely. Scipio has returned, the young man said, his impatience to be the first to inform Duilius, causing him to blurt out the words. What? When? Duilius said, standing, his voice loud in the muted, in the muted chamber, the seated senator beside him forgotten. Just now, I saw him crossing the forum. Duilius' mind raced to understand the reason behind the senior consul's sudden reappearance. Why over a week early? Okay. <laughs> well, our streak is unbroken. That was awful. <laughs> All right, so the, the opening paragraph we're just going to leave out. I'm just going to skip the opening paragraph about senatorial politics. None of it applies to ancient Rome. None of it has any grounding in any kind of reconstitutionable fact. It's just blather. <laughs> so we're going to move on. We're going to move on. <laughs> From there, uh, <laughs> to all of the bad writing. Now, this one it has the bad research of all of the other two excerpts, and it is also uh, turgid, like the other two excerpts. But this one also has lots of bad writing, uh, noticeably bad writing. Like, for instance, Lucius Manlius Volso Longus, a recently elected senator, quickly adjusted his gaze to the gloomy interior and rapidly searched the room for the man whose acceptance he craved more than anything in the world. So he quickly adjusted his gaze to the gloomy interior, and then rapidly searched the room. So did he rapidly adjust his gaze to the gloomy interior and then quickly search the room? 
Did he? Does it change anything if you remove if you swap if you swap out those words? And if it doesn't change anything, then neither of the words is necessary. Uh, and also, I, uh, uh, he, it's almost literally every line. Uh, he spotted Duilius and crossed the floor, his appearance putting an end to the honeyed words that Duilius had been speaking to a senator beside him, a senator whose vote Duilius had purchased many times. Honeyed words is a cliche, and why, if he's purchased this man's vote many times, would he still be honeying him? <laughs> if, the, if the senator next to, this, to Duilius is for sale, then he's a figure of contempt, not, not cajolery. Uh, the, uh, the, the junior consul looked up irritably, what is it, Longus? He asked brusquely. Well, <laughs> you don't have to tell us that he looked up irritably. You've already told us that he's being interrupted. And you don't have to say that he asked brusquely. What is it does that? You don't need to describe what you're showing us. And then, Scipio has returned, the young man said, his impatience to be the first to inform Duilius, really causing him to blurt out the words. <laughs> but Scipio has returned, exclamation point, does all that. It does the rest of it. You can leave off the rest of it. You just draw a line through it and edit it. But it didn't happen there. Uh, what? When? Julia said, standing, his voice loud in the muted chamber, the seated senator beside him forgotten. <laughs> okay. First of all, the senate chamber wouldn't be muted. And second, all you have to do is say that, he, that he's saying what, when, and standing up. You don't have to tell us that he's forgotten the man he was just talking to. That is obvious. You don't have to lead us by the nose. <laughs> uh... uh and then Duilius's mind raced to understand the reason behind the senior consul's sudden reappearance. Uh, mind racing is a cliche. And also, uh, by this point, you've said junior consul, senior consul, junior consul, senior consul so many times uh, that, <laughs> that your readers are going to think they can't tell their senators without a scorecard. It's just bad writing. It's, this, is just, this is a classic example of writing that doesn't trust its reader. Which always bothers me when I read it. It always bothers me when I review it, and I try never to write it. <laughs> so, so this page one hundred and twelve tag was uh, <laughs> not successful in terms of the one of the the goals that you're supposed to do when you when you do this is to decide sort of which one intrigues you the most, which one you liked the most. They're all three garbage. And uh, when I mentioned at the beginning of the tag that. Someone must have sent this to me because they knew that I loved Roman historical fiction and that I've even written Roman historical fiction. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention about Roman historical fiction is that most of it is awful. <laughs> it's very rare that you find something that's any good. That's true with any period. But ancient Rome seems to bring people out of the woodwork who cannot write and who just want, I don't know, to parade their research or lack thereof in this case. But anyway, now we're going to look at the answers. I didn't recognize any of these, so I don't think these, and not that any one of these is a book that I've read. Um, so, uh, excerpt number one, which was god-awful, is Spartacus Rebellion by Ben Cain. Oh, no! Ben Cain is usually good. Oh, all right. Well, we must have caught him. His action scenes are wonderful. We, we must have caught him at a bad moment. <laughs> In a, uh, book number two is Empire Series Wounds of Honor by Anthony Riches. Never heard of it or him. And don't want to. <laughs> and uh, and book number three, the one with the egregiously bad writing, is A Ship of Rome by John Stack. Never heard of it or him. <laughs> so so uh, there you go. That is an... an uh, yikes. <laughs> that was an, uh, a, an Ancient Rome, page 112 tag. Uh, I'm going to go now and cleanse my palate. <laughs> I'll see you soon. Thank you, book two.